Um, my name is Joel Hinman, and I'm going to be your host, along with my colleague tonight, who's Lisa Badner, and she runs the tutorial writing program at the Writer Studio. And this is the first time that we've done this for the tutorial students, and I'm going to have Lisa explain how that's different from our classes. But this is something that came about last year during COVID when we realized that, no, we weren't going to be having our usual readings in bars or restaurants or something. But instead, because we were remote, people got used to this idea, and that allowed us suddenly to bring in people from all over. And tonight, that's the case, is we have people all over the country who are tutorial students who have come together to read for us this evening. So it's the first time we've been able to celebrate this aspect of what we've been doing for years. Now, if you're not familiar with the Writer Studio, we're a non-accredited program that was started 34 years ago by Pulitzer Prize winning poet Philip Schultz. And our program is based in New York and Tucson and uh, San Francisco, and now in Rome, Italy. And we offer classes that are in memoir, in fiction and in poetry. And in fact, we've added a, a bunch of smaller classes, which is the very end I'm gonna talk to you about what we do in that order. But we also, uh, in addition to classrooms, which are both online and in person, we have this tutorial program, which is an intensive one-on-one. -on -one. And for that, um, uh, a discussion of that, I want to talk. Uh, um, I want to turn this over to my colleague Lisa Badner uh, to tell us a little bit more about the tutorial program before we start in. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much, Joel, for pulling this together. And this was like all Joel, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, <laughs> So Joel asked me to say a few words about the tutorial program, and that should be really easy, but the truth is the program is really tailor-made for each student. Um, but in big sweeping terms, it's a one-on-one -on -one program um, with an instructor who, for each student, and after I ask a bunch of questions, um, is... Uh, working with a teacher who is the right fit for that student. Um, and the teachers, as you know, are amazing and they've all been trained through the school and through the master class. Uh, as far as what tutorials do, uh, tutorials, people use tutorials as workshops with exercises as if it were a workshop. Um, we have tutorials which work as uh, for novels, for short stories. Um, some tutorials have uh, students who are revising a manuscript, they're revising a novel. Some are working from scratch. Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really what you need. Um, and we find the teacher who will use the school's method to help you realize that work. Um, so if you're interested to learn more, uh, of course, take a look at the website and or you can always send an inquiry to info at writerstudio with one S dot com and it, that will come to me. So I hope that that gives a little bit of a summation, but I'm really excited to hear from you tonight. So the last thing I'm going to say before I introduce the, the first reader is this. What the Writer's Studio does is it sort of assumes that you're going to be dealing as a writer with difficult material, stuff that has meant a lot to you and has caused all sorts of difficulties in your life. And so the solution, as far as we're concerned, is that you use craft as the handrail. That's the thing that allows you to tackle the things that have been difficult, but have, have been an emotional source for your writing. So one of the things about the tutorial program that you should appreciate is these people are really dedicated and they have worked extremely hard at this craft and all of them work one on one, which is very different from the diffusion that you get in a classroom. So in a way, this is the most courageous group because they have really intensified their application of the writing craft, which is a very difficult art form. And I think the thing about the art form that's interesting, and I think you're going to see this in the next few minutes, is that the better you get, the less they notice the craft because they're enthralled with your story. We want to immerse you in the stories. Anyway, enough of that. At the end, I'm going to turn, uh, I'll come back in and, and talk to you guys a little bit about the writer's studio. 
But because we're late, I'd like to really get going. Tonight, you're going to hear from, by the way, Cynthia Bruckman, Lael Cassidy, who went through the tutorial program, and now we're very proud as one of our teachers. We're going to hear from Nancy Green, Janice Hoffman, Sydney Girard, John Lantus, and Jane Leader. Okay, so tonight we're starting our, um, our journey with Janice Hoffman. And just so you know, Janice worked in the security industry for 35 years. Uh, she lives in Claremont, California with her husband, Larry, and Karina, their Maltese. And she found Michelle Herman's memoir class in May of 2020. And that just started a, uh, a journey of thousands of words to get to this point. I forgive you for not wiping the counters last night. I forgive you. I forgive you for letting the pot boil over and not noticing Roomba is off his charger. When preparing healthy meals becomes tedious instead of a pleasure, scraps of this and that ubiquitous dirty dishes. I forgive you for eating a pretzel bar and then succumbing to hapless entertainment after a day of wearying chores, not remembering your good fortunes, others only dream of. I forgive you for choosing the privileged response over gratitude, for wanting more, for wanting less, for being the first to smell the garbage and the last to smell the flowers. I forgive you. I forgive that you are rusty at rejoicing. When you misplace your phone en route, your daily micro journeys, personal space to communal living, multiple loops, life cycles, repeat. I forgive that you panic before you reason. I forgive that you momentarily look over your shoulder to see if mental fragility is gaining on you. I forgive you for wanting to please, <laughs> for responding with a thoughtless yes, rather than a thoughtful no, thank you, I forgive you. For wanting to tell people how to live, for allowing you should to enter your mind and leave your mouth, I forgive you. For not always being present for forgetting to focus with care and concern, for starting another paragraph before responding to yours, for asking personal questions that are none of my business, I forgive you. Forgiveness is taking a breath, relaxing the eye sockets, unhinging the jaw, opening the throat, rotating the shoulder blades, encouraging the scapulae to kiss, lifting the torso, making room for the heart, spanning the spine, wrapping skin around belly and thighs without rebuke and reconnecting to mother earth and just beginning again. Caring more about doing than being or allowing life's imperfections detract from life's precious moments never to be repeated. I forgive you. Gee, that was awkward. We'll remember that next time if there's two pieces. <laughs> um, this one is called When He F. Hutton Talked, I Listened. By the mid 80s, I had sung and played the piano every day of my life for 30 years since the age of six. So then E. F. Hutton talked and I listened. I listened some more, applied for their training program, and in 1984, on April Fool's Day, I became a fully licensed stock and commodities broker. It was not a hard transition because I had earned a doctorate in event planning with a specialty in telling people what to do. It was cleverly disguised as a doctorate of musical arts in choral conducting. 
the ink was barely dry on my diploma before I knew I'd made a mistake. I was miserable. And I felt that it was just a matter of time before the Peter principal would expose me as an incompetent fraud. So I changed to a career where incompetent frauds existed in abundance. Because I knew my motives were pure, I assumed I would survive, perhaps even thrive. In my former data, I took raw data, excuse me, in my former career, I took raw data, molded it into a format people could understand and presented it, whether it was Mozart's Requiem or an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. In my new job, I studied financial instruments for the purpose of understanding their properties in order to match them with the client's financial needs. As a liberal arts graduate, I knew how to learn. And as a musician, I knew how to rehearse and perform. And those skills translated into being a decent financial advisor, especially for creative types who I understood because I am one and I know how to talk to right brainers without their eyes glazing over. I had been in line for a promotion to associate professor when I walked away from my life as a choral conductor. 13 months later, things were going surprisingly well. Then E.F. Hutton got caught for check hiding. As a financial advisor, name musician, I had credibility issues anyway, so cold calling for a firm that was being criminally indicted was a drawback. Always light on my feet, I pivoted. And shortly thereafter, went to work for a company so stable that the Rock of Gibraltar was their logo. Remember Kurt Eichenwald? His bestseller, Conspiracy of Fools, was about the Enron scandal and the informant, the expose of ABN's international price fixing scheme was made into a movie starring Matt Damon as the whistleblower. However, Eichenwald made his name in the corporate malfeasance genre with his breakthrough blockbuster in 1994, Serpent on the Rock, about prudential securities. The book Jacket promised and delivered an exciting story of backstabbing, lying, embezzling, and cover-ups. The tagline was, just another day on Wall Street. I was the clueless schlep in the trenches, but my clients and I survived and I was able to procure a more stable job with a more stable company, a division of Lehman Brothers. Fortunately, they had divested themselves of Shearson Lehman before their legendary bankruptcy in 2008. So for 30 years, I worked for five companies all the while sitting at the same desk, in the same building, advising the same clients, saying the same things. It's time in the market rather than timing in the market. It's one of those lines, although true, I've said more times than I care to remember. But I never budged. I was steadfast. My business card, however, changed from Shearson to Smith Barney to Citigroup to Morgan Stanley, and then I retired. In May of 2020, with the help of a Google search, I found Michelle's memoir class at the Writer's Studio. And that was hundreds of thousands of words and numerous publication rejections ago. Thank you. And now I'm pleased to introduce Nancy Green. Nancy's work has been published in Bellevue Literary Review, Fiction Now, Minerva Rising, The Writer's Studio at 30 Anthology and elsewhere. Nancy is one of the founders of Castillo Theater in New York City. She was a student in Philip Schultz's masterclass and is thrilled to be working with Isabel DeConnick in the tutorial program. Nancy. Thank you, Janice, and thank you so much for everyone being here tonight. 
Um, I'm going to be reading from um, my short story called Comrades. The sight of Rachel Garber entering the Midtown Smile Center made Eileen Dolan's adrenaline surge. Red flag warnings waved through her Selexa subdued brain, commanding her to run. But where? The plate glass door closed behind Rachel with measured pneumatic control. Eileen had been coming there for months, sinking into debt, tending to cavities, agreeing to gum work, submitting to crowns. It was her waiting room. She'd come in that day in August 1999 for an abscess, not a reunion with Rachel. The Power to the People Collective was kaput, disbanded six years ago. Its erstwhile cadre had scattered, and Eileen was done with organizing, protesting, mobilizing. She watched Rachel bring out a winning smile on the young receptionist's face, still spreading light, boosting worker morale with some uplifting bon mot. Rachel's trim figure was the same tidy marvel Eileen remembered, now in black capris and a summery linen tunic. No telltale signs of surrender on comrade Rachel, as far as Eileen could see, feeling herself hideous in baggy sweatpants, her limp, ashy blonde hair fastened in a sloppy top knot with a drugstore scrunchie, poster child for fled ideals. Rachel turned and they locked stairs. Eileen, Rachel's voice resonated with familiar restrained warmth, nothing wasted on sentimental bourgeois frippery. Eileen returned her smile, her parched lips snagging on her teeth. Once Eileen would have seized any chance to talk with Rachel and analyze the world, discuss conditions. She would hang on every word, Rachel being her leader, her mentor in all things Marxist during her socialist salad days. They'd worked shoulder to shoulder throughout the Reagan 80s, that gilded dismal decade, carrying out the collective's work with a life or death urgency as if a massive historic fire drill were in progress and they, the PPC, were evacuating the masses from the burning house of capitalism. Amazing to Eileen, whenever she thought of herself back then, that much certainty in life is a time bomb. These days, Eileen was focused on a smaller subset of humanity, me, myself, and I. She must reinvent herself, according to her therapist. He'd listened impassively, scribbling on a pad while Eileen, relieved that somebody was taking notes, spilled her pail of woe. Eileen was 42, fired from her job as a charity events planner, and abruptly single, dumped by Paul, beloved remnant from the collective, after their 13 years together. And now Eileen was losing her apartment, a sparsely furnished basement she'd rented in Queens after the breakup. Her landlord, Ari, needed the apartment back for one of his brothers moving over from Athens. Don't worry, he'd assured Eileen that morning. He'd find her an even better basement, bigger. Now Rachel beamed, walking unhurriedly toward her as if rolling on invisible casters. Eileen, she said, it's been forever. Not since the collective, Eileen said, striking a neutral tone, trying to blend with the waiting room's hegemonic beige. Rising, she noticed the People magazine she'd been reading was still in her hand and flustered Eileen, the correct Eileen of yesteryear, thrust the degenerate celebrity drivel back on the rack. They hugged. Let's sit over there, Rachel said, motioning toward two empty chairs in the corner. Eileen noticed how easily her former leader took possession of her elbow, cupping it in her palm. How are you, Rachel asked. Grimacing, Eileen pointed to her jaw. An abscess, she said, excruciating, especially when I talk. Ouch, Rachel said, frowning solicitously. 
Eileen avoided her sympathetic eyes. In truth, the tooth was all but dead, dosed as it was with Tylenol and her psychotropics. Sometimes a menacing twinge broke through the fog, but the pain was low on Eileen's hierarchy of aches. I'll manage, she said, cradling her cheek in her hand. Her disintegration was her own business, to be processed exclusively with her therapist. You talk, she said. Me? Rachel seemed delighted. Eileen listened to Rachel with a mixture of awe and numbing fatigue. Rachel had made a smooth, peaceful transition from Marxist collective into marriage, a family, and a rewarding teaching career. She lived with her psychiatrist husband, Kurt, and a stepson who was starting college. Wedged into the corner, sitting knee to knee, felt awkward to Eileen, a jarring new stage in their relationship. Rachel's chatty, casual manner felt at odds with their comportment of yore. When Eileen would report from the field, a Kmart parking lot, outside a factory gate, or wherever she had been deployed, often alone, to spread socialism. She'd call Rachel long distance. How many people signed a petition, joined a committee, attended a rally? Those minutes with Rachel made her feel connected to something bigger than herself. The musty loneliness of an interstate motel room would become transformed as they talked. The grandeur of history expanding the water-stained walls. Now, Eileen darted uneasy glances at Rachel and at a large laminated poster hanging on the wall behind her, demonstrating the five steps to proper flossing. I'm at Columbia now, Eileen, sociology. The students are so ready for change. They've started two anti-racism committees and a healthcare policy initiative. You inspire them, Eileen said, hearing the wan, deferential strain in her voice. Rachel hadn't given up the fight, whereas she snored all day on her futon, inert beneath a plaid duvet. Shirker, Eileen, too depressed to lift a finger and over a man. I know just what you're thinking, Eileen, Rachel said. Eileen blushed ferociously. You're wondering when I ever sleep with all I'm doing. But really, who can sleep with the shape the world's in? Rachel grew solemn, gazing strategically over Eileen's shoulder, as if sizing up a broken world in need of her repair. Eileen ransacked her mind for something progressive to say. She liked to think she still cared about the plight of the world. From down the hall, she could hear saliva being sucked through a hose. Thank you. Jane Murphy Later is an award-winning author whose books have explored teen suicide, brothers and sisters, and love and sex in World War II. Her personal essays have been published on a variety of online literary sites, and her feature articles have appeared in a host of local and national publications. You can follow later on her blog at 70andme.com. Please welcome Jane. Thank you everybody for hanging around. Um, yes, I'm going to read a piece called Robert the Reader. And this was initially intended to be a chapter in a memoir. I never wrote the memoir, but this is an edited version of a personal narrative, Robert the Reader. I stood shivering on the sidewalk in front of an unremarkable red brick two-story home that unlike a growing number of its neighbors up and down the block, had not been touched in decades. Packing tape covered a zigzagging break I mean, in one of the front windows. Peeling green shutters banged against the facade in the unforgiving Chicago wind. I considered forgetting about interviewing Robert, a psychic reader, but I needed his story for a magazine feature piece. When Robert finally opened the door to his first floor apartment, he motioned for me to sit down in a straight back, 
upholstered chair in front of a fireplace that from the absence of wood, ashes, or smell had not been used in a long time. I kept my wool coat wrapped around my shoulders as protection against the cold and against this strange man with uncombed stringy hair and a wrinkled shirt only half tucked into his baggy pants covered with stains. Robert asked me a question before I had a chance to ask one of mine. On what day is your life going to change, he said, reaching for his own pad and paper. <laughs> you mean what day out of 365? Yes, he said impatiently, having already written something and turned the pad of paper face down on the table that separated us. I, I, I don't have a clue. Of course you do, he said. I, I don't know, I muttered. I mean, all I had on my calendar was a reminder not to wear any deodorant for my upcoming mammogram. I don't have much time, Robert said. Just give me a date. Frustrated, I tossed out the first one that came to mind. How about May 15th? Robert turned over the pad. He'd written May 15th with May 23rd in parentheses. You think it's going to be May 15th, he said, but it will actually be the 23rd. All right, a lucky guess. Uh, anyway, he was hedging his bet with the second date. And coming up with the day was impressive, but hardly conclusive. Besides, he didn't say how my life was going to change. And I was so flustered that I forgot to ask. One side of Robert's upper lift twitched slightly. This didn't feel like a magician doing a card trick. No, this felt spooky, surreal, serious. What are you going to call your no book, Robert said. I wrapped my arms around my middle. He couldn't have known that I'd written a book. There was no internet in 1987. The interview had turned into an inquisition for which I was completely unprepared. I hadn't walked up those front cement steps on a frigid December morning to talk about my brother Robin's suicide that had been the motivation for writing the book. Robert's impatient voice interrupted my thoughts. What are you gonna call your book? Robert asked again. He tapped his left foot repeatedly, and I wanted to kick it and then make a beeline for the front door. I watched as he wrote on that damn pay to paper. I don't know. I said, I'm not sure, but I think maybe I'm going to call it dead serious. My heart pounded as he turned over the pad of paper. It read dead serious. Robert leaned back in his chair and without looking at me said, you've been waking up in the middle of the night, why? I touched my face, I mean, did I look that bad? I thought I'd put on enough makeup to cover the puffy bags under my eyes. I questioned why I wasn't sleeping well, but I hadn't come up with an explanation, but then sitting with Robert, I knew exactly why. I, I know why, I said. And I'm waking up because my dead brother is trying to contact me. Robert pushed the pad in front of me. Turn it over and read, he instructed. My hand shook as I turned the pad over. It read, your dead brother Rob is trying to contact you. My head throbbed as if someone were using it like a bongo drum, but Robert didn't give me a chance to breathe. Your brother has a lot to say to you right now, he said. So when you get up in the middle of the night, listen to him. I wanted an apology from my brother Robin for not having said goodbye. I wanted an explanation about the violent way he'd chosen to end his life. He could have taken a bottle of sleeping pills or slit his wrists instead of sticking a hunting rifle in his mouth and pulling the trigger. If his intention was to get my attention, he'd succeeded. 
He'd taken his own life, and in the process, he'd taken a part of mine. And here was this Robert guy with the same name as my brother. Was this some kind of cosmic coincidence? I didn't find it amusing or reassuring. Robert stood up and moved toward the front door. Was that it? Were we done? I should have felt relieved that our session had ended, but despite my discomfort, I was intrigued and duly convinced that Robert did see things that the rest of us mortals did not. That kind of perception seemed more of a burden than a gift. Robert was staring at a large shrink wrap poster of Marilyn Monroe that hung on the living room wall. I wondered whether he put it there as a tribute to another tortured soul. His shoulders slumped. He looked much smaller than when we first met. I need to rest, he said. Robert closed the door behind me. I never looked back. About a month later, I'd just fallen asleep when a breeze of air wafted over my face like the stream from a humidifier. My brother was back. I closed my eyes and there were the two of us sharing a large comfy chair in the living room of our then family cottage, both of us smiling into the bright summer sun streaming through the windows facing Lake Erie. I'm staring straight ahead and without my glasses, my right eye heads a bit too far to the left. But there we are, brother and sister, maybe nine and 12, best buddies who could never anticipated Robin's troubled future and my eternal sadness at not being able to stem his pain and make him whole. It's time to move out, I blurted. I waited, half expecting my brother to speak. Instead, he nodded his head just once, turned around and walked right through my closet. I've never seen Robin again but I talk to him all the time. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Cynthia Bruckman, who lives on Vancouver Island. She's currently writing her first memoir, and she's thrilled to be working with Joel, who was her first teacher at the Writer's Studio. She has recent work in Mason Street, which is the literary magazine of Newark Public Library and the Colicella Review. You can connect with her at CynthiaBruckman.com. Cynthia? Um, Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am reading from my memoir in progress. Um, In this scene, I am braiding two different voices. Uh, This chapter is called Secret Codes. When I listened to my Nona's voice on tape talking about falling in love with my Nono, the tone of it changes. I can tell she's smiling while recounting her young self, feverishly crisscrossing the top of the boot of Italy during wartime. The two of them passionately parting and reuniting in Florence, Bologna, and Pisa. And she feels him, you know? Maybe she's self-aware of the longing she knows I'll hear in her voice and the lust buried just beneath it, because there are a few rough cuts or points where she abruptly stops recording like she suddenly has to step away for a moment before she turns it on again. I know what it's like for her to feel his body, but it's not there. I meet Ricky at the Coney Island Freak Museum at Sideshows by the Seashore. My sister's visiting from San Francisco, and for her birthday, she wants to see Coney. While my sister and her wife are checking out jars of pickled human parts, I'm checking out Ricky. 
he's not one of the freaks, although you could argue everyone working here. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very although you could argue everyone working here is on the freaky spectrum. He's the guy at the door taking tickets. A bald Puerto Rican around my age with ripped biceps and tender hearted eyes. We strike up a conversation and it's almost embarrassing how we both share a nerd-like affinity for everything Coney. It's nostalgic history, the vintage freaks, the beach and the mermaid parade. Before moving to the East Coast, I starred in a play that I wrote about Clara Bow, Hollywood's it girl, a Coney Island native. Here on Surf Avenue and beyond is all my research in the flesh and blood. Nathan's famous hot dogs, Steeplechase Park and Luna Park, the rickety and completely unsafe cyclone roller coaster and the Wonder Wheel. And here's this hot guy who grew up in the hood before moving to Canarsie and he knows all about Clara and Coney's sideshow lore. After we leave, I let my friend Julie run back and give him my phone number because it's obvious to everyone, my sister, her wife, and Julie, sparks were a flying. But Rick and I, a couple of geeks, are too shy to make a move. Nona. First, he was moved to Pisa. From there, he didn't know where exactly he would be sent. He thought maybe the South Pacific. We made a secret code for the different possibilities of where he could be sent. He said, if I send you a letter, then I'll say I'm going to, you know, so-and-so, a fictitious name, and I would know where he would go. When he was in Pisa, I managed to go there too but I didn't know how to get a hold of him. Look, it's not Pisa's leaning tower with the high drama of World War II as a backdrop, but it's our own kind of Pisa, Coney in the 1990s. He didn't know where I was, so we made a plan that every day at a certain hour when he was at Liberty, we would go to the Tower of Pisa. That was the only place of reference that we knew, and we would meet there. I'm just starting to get priced out of my East Village apartment. Realtors are priming even the rough edges of Alphabet City for fashion models and bankers, but Brooklyn's still holding on to its gold chains and wife beater tees. If Manhattan gives you Ajita, you can hop on the F train to Coney Island and let it transport you back in time where a bearded lady will swallow fire and couples tongue hungrily under sun umbrellas cocked at sharp angles, their poles stabbing little mounds of sand. Right across the street from the Tower of Pisa, there was an antique shop. I went in to inquire if I could rent a room. There was such a nice lady there. Her name was Norina. She started taking a liking to me. She said, well, you can come and stay with me and my mother at my house. So for two, three days, every day at this certain hour, I was there looking to the Tower of Pisa across the street. Every couple creates their own language when they fall in love. My friend Bob, who's just lost his partner of 24 years, tells me this over a joint, smoke swirling between us as we bond over our losses. A language understood by only two people, full of nonverbals, nuance, innuendo, and secret codes. When the relationship ends or someone dies, the language dies too. Finally, one day, my Terry, Satimio, he had a special whistle that I never heard from anybody. It was like uh, a bird chirping. I heard his special whistle and I ran across the street and he ran across to me. It was quite a reunion, very emotional, very exciting. When Ricky dies, I find the sepia colored strip of sexy photos we took in a photo booth on the Coney Island boardwalk. 
We're so insanely in love, it hurts to look at them. In one, our eyes are closed. He's standing behind me and my head's tilted back, offering up my neck to his kiss. Get a room, you'd say out loud if you were looking at it. In another, he's squeezing my boobs. His eyes are bulging. I'm squealing with laughter. For kicks, we used to place our hands side by side as we do on that afternoon. His dark skin next to my white skin. Mocha chocolate, we say, cracking up and daydreaming about the little mixed race Coney Island baby we might make someday. I was there for a few days and then he had to go because I think it was August 1945, a few days before the atomic bomb was thrown over Japan. When we said goodbye again, he didn't know where he would be sent. It could be the South Pacific, but he didn't know for how long or when we would see each other. He didn't know anything. So it was quite a heartbreaking goodbye. At his funeral, his sister-in-law reads a poem about how he never got out of Brooklyn and his life was so unfulfilling, yada, yada. And then his father and his sister recite some passages from the Bible and my eyes are rolling to the back of my head. None of this is who he is. On the walls of this Bay Ridge funeral parlor, I've taped photos on poster boards of our trips to Canada. California, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, and he didn't consider himself religious. Suddenly, just when someone's asking, is there anyone else who'd like to say something, in walk the freaks. Dick Ziggin, the mayor of Coney Island, Rick's boss at the sideshow, and Eek the Geek who tattooed his face like outer space. Dick in his hunter-ass tinted glasses and top hat, and Eek with his tattooed face. Everyone's turning their heads, staring. First Dick and then Eek speak about Rick's kind heart and his sense of fun. Eek can't stop. Ricky, man. I remember when it was just him and me, man. Hanging on the beach, the sun the water, the light on the water, just shooting the shit. That's what we did every day after work down there on the boardwalk. I'm gonna miss him, man. He was like my brother. Everyone, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, can feel the molecules buzzing in the air. It's undeniable he's in the room with us. Popping out of that little taped up tin of ashes, sitting on the table up front, his real, authentic freak of a self is in the room. It's a transcendent moment. I'm laughing through snot and tears, and I can practically hear him laughing too. I'll always be grateful to Dick and Eek to the freaks, for seeing Ricky, for making everyone else really see him too, and for sending him off in a way he deserved. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, the next person, the next reader, and that is Lael. So Lael Cassidy teaches at the Writer's Studio and writes poems, stories, and essays. Her work has appeared in Headline Poetry and Press, Silver Birch, Underwood Press, and Beyond Words. She has also written, get this, 16 nonfiction children's books. Whoa. She lives in Seattle and is currently at work on a novel. Take it away, Leal. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is a chapter from the novel that I've been working on. I'm calling it The Hanged Man. And all you really need to know is that it's set in 1944, New York City. 
Letty is breathless in the doorway, having just arrived home when mother announces that grandpa is missing. There is no hubbub in the kitchen, no smell of cabbage, no smell of grandpa's apple tobacco. Her brother Jinx hasn't looked up. He sits hunched and formless in the chair, still in his coat. Mother is turned away. She looks out the kitchen window where darkness falls like a storm. He must have lost track of time. It has to be, Jinx says, and wraps his knuckles in a galloping rhythm on the table. Letty's hands itch for the tarot cards in her bag, but she doesn't reach for them. The dollar she earned telling fortunes all day crinkles against her chest under her slip. Every day it's the same. Women ask about missing husbands and whether they'll be back. Once in a while, the answer is good. She asks who was the last to see him. Later, the three of them will remember this recitation of who saw him when as the exact moment they lost grandpa. Everyone had seen him that morning. Jinx had seen him in his chair after lunch. It wasn't until days later that they would find the opened letter with the French postmark tucked in his raincoat, the letter in Yiddish and replete with exclamation points, a story of peril and narrow escape, and phrases like, but sadly, and I don't know how to tell you this, but, and a too long list of names of the deceased or disappeared. They don't imagine the letter yet, only trouble on a neighborhood scale, that he's been playing chess, lost all his money and is doubling down trying to get it back, or that he's gotten mixed up with the Russian carriage drivers outside Central Park, taken in by another scheme to get rich quick. The worst they think is that he's wandered into the wrong neighborhood and been beaten bloody. I'll go look for him. Jinx says. In his hurry to leave the apartment, Jinx stumbles and bumps Letty's elbow, bumps Letty's bag. Mother says she'll ask the neighbors what they know and leaves the door gaping. When Letty says, I'll wait here, she's already alone. She thinks of the cards and they answer with a jolt, the X11 of the number 12, the hanged man. In front of her, the image larger than life, a figure suspended upside down, one foot tied to the T of a tree, the face peaceful despite being bound because of what he has achieved. He is beyond everything, all of the trappings of the world. It makes her think of something. She rushes into grandpa's room and rifles through private things. Threadbare socks rolled into balls, neatly folded handkerchiefs, underwear, and yes, she has been looking for this a hand-carved wooden box. Once he pulled out the contents and showed her something she almost remembers. Inside she finds three nondescript stones, a piece of blue ribbon, a lock of hair tied with string and under the handwritten letters, tied with rope that still smell of lavender water, this, a newspaper clipping, yellowed and crumbling at its edges. Harry Houdini bound in a straight jacket hanging upside down from a crane over a New York City sidewalk. Grandpa loved Houdini, that a Jew such as himself could escape handcuffs, chains, straight jackets, being locked in boxes underwater. He could even escape the police. She thinks escape and she knows. Grandpa is on the roof. The contents of the box have spilled on the floor because she is already down the hall and up three flights of stairs. The heavy door slams open with a burst caught by the wind. The view expands like a giant inhalation revealing a vast sky. She is on an island in a sea of buildings, the gray waves all around, jagged and frozen. Grandpa is on the ledge. Later, she will think of how we seem to be in communion with God. But now she is thinking that he looks so strong, the muscular outline of his back, the proud slope of his shoulders, the city spread out below. He is no longer grandpa. He is instead an ancient king. But the street lurches upwards and he steps forward, balanced on one foot, then shifts and plummets all in a rush of air. An amazing disappearance. But he runs to the edge, throat choked because she isn't breathing. His body hits the pavement with a cruel cracking thud. She looks down, sees the strangely bent arms and legs, the blood pooling around his head. Mother Letty and Jinx meet in the street, each having seen from one vantage or another what has happened. Letty from above, Jinx from below, 
mother out of Mrs. Rubenstein's kitchen window through the steam of an overcooked borscht, a falling shadow wearing a familiar shoe. Mother's eyes are squeezed shut. Letty holds her face in her hands. Jinx absorbs small details, the white of a rib poking through grandpa's flannel shirt, a trail of blood inching like a caterpillar toward the curb. People gather in alarm, asking each other if they've seen what happened, as if such a thing mattered. Mother Letty and Jinx are being consumed by eyeballs. Drama has hoisted them on stage and strangers arrive on cue to receive their secondary roles. There is the woman who comforts the crying daughter without concern for the tears that stain her shirt. The soldier who asks if he should fetch the doctor or he lowers his voice, those that care for the dead. There is the old man who is given authority because of his hat and long peyote, because of his dark suit and tzitzit, who with one hand on his beard and the other covering his mouth shakes his head from side to side to say no, there is no life here to save. He says to get a cart and men to move him. He says to get the rabbi. Mother with sudden impulse tears at her shirt as tradition prescribes. A man's voice speaks mother's name, Rose, he says. And the sound lands like a period at the end of a sentence, the last sentence in a book. The three of them study the rabbi with full attention, this first sighting of what's next. He is bug-eyed, tucking in his shirt and straightening his coat, barely in costume. Mother sees a drunk whose beard needs trimming. Jinx sees a geezer he could easily swindle at craps. Letty sees the hierophant card in reverse. Distorted authority, a new corruption. The rabbi pulls mother by the arm, moves a hand around her waist, and the three of them feel Shiva begin, the seven-day imprisonment closing in around them. The black-clad figure guides their mother inside and the children follow with heads bowed. Now, John Lantos, he is a pediatrician and bioethicist. He directs a bioethics center at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. He has published hundreds of peer reviewed papers and 10 books. He writes about ethical issues, difficult conversations and health policy. Take it away, John, don't forget to unmute. This is called Medicine in a Time of COVID. Thanks to the Writers' Workshop for inviting me, and especially my tutor, Michelle Harmon, who's slogged through long versions of this and helped me sharpen it up a little bit. Uh, so Medicine in a Time of COVID. I could not sleep. I gorged on news like a binging bulimic, and I went to work. My first patient, two-year-old girl. Grandma was worried about constipation. The kid looked great. Grandma talked about how his mom was in prison and she just didn't have the energy. I imagined what the little boy felt. One day he woke up and his mother was gone. He didn't want to lose anything else. So he was holding everything in. We all were. I prescribed some Miralax. Then a five-year-old girl with asthma. Mom spoke no English. The little girl understood everything. She looked at her uncomprehending mother with both tender love and baffled pity. I imagined her family captured at the border, children held in cages. Girls wheezing disappeared with a few puffs of an inhaler. Then a three-year-old with a fever and a cough, typical viral symptoms. But could this three-year-old have the new coronavirus? We had no tests to figure it out. We didn't know what to fear. So fear was everywhere. I was supposed to know what was going on, but I was stumbling about in the same fog as everyone else. I didn't feel brave. I felt confused and afraid that I'd die alone in an isolation room. People applauded me. I felt unworthy. This was a strange war to fight. I organized a course for medical students about doctors in plague times. We read Camus, a plague was sweeping through the town. One doctor develops an experimental anti-serum and they try it on a dying child. It takes longer than usual for the child to die, so he suffers more. The doctors see this as a sign of hope. 
that the anti-serum might be perfected. For the priest, it leads to despair. My friend Wally, an entrepreneur, was mad at God. If he's truly all powerful, Wally argued, he could have prevented this. Either he's not all powerful or he just doesn't care. Another friend, Mark, a rabbi, argued back, do you think you can understand God's purposes? Do you think that God owes you something? I don't expect anything from God. I am not hopeless. Like any astute doctor, I believe in cures and in miracles. Every healthy newborn is a miracle. When something goes wrong, we realize how astounding it is that so often everything goes right. To Wally's question, I can only answer that God, if there is a God, watches thousands of children die every day of measles and malaria and rotavirus. We're excited by the pandemic, but we've become numb to the shocking horror of all the old familiar diseases. I asked Wally why he believed in God. He talked about walking through the woods at sunset and feeling a force larger than himself guiding him to make certain life choices. And he said the choices had turned out to be good ones. I wondered what would have happened to his faith if a choice turned out badly. Wally's God it seems is a heavenly investment advisor who helps Wally maximize return on investment. My long dead father came to visit me in a dream. He and Tony Fauci were interviewing a patient. The patient was ranting about shuttered steel plants and Chinese virology labs. Fauci tried to calm him down. The patient reached down into the front of his pants, pulled out a gun, put it to my dad's head and pulled the trigger. The gun was a squirt gun. Dad was drenched. I woke in a sweat, my heart pounding. My dad was a good doctor. He had dignity, he had mastery. He was recognized as a sort of mystic, as a man familiar with death and sexually transmitted diseases and the many ways that people can go into slow, inexorable decline. He was not a warm man. He was always distant, like he was looking at the world through a scrim. I was starting to do the same. My days were a days of purposelessness. My nights, strange adventures in sleepless anxiety. Sometimes in those dark hours, my fear of dying transformed into a feeling that dying from COVID might be a relief. And surprisingly, that gave me the energy to get up and go to work. Perhaps the pandemic is a metaphor for the mystery of divine justice or a call for collective repentance. Or perhaps it's as random and meaningless as a lightning strike. I absolutely believe in miracles, but I expect neither advice nor rewards from God. Thanks. Next is Sidney Girard, who's been writing books since the second grade. And in 2017, she won a fellowship from the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College. Two weeks ago, she left a 14-year career in book publishing to write full-time and offer conscious language editing through her editorial agency, Speakeasy. She lives in Hudson, New York. So I am reading from my young adult novel, Tragedy May, which follows 17 year old May as she enters Rising Star, a residential treatment facility for at risk youth following a suicide attempt. And this excerpt takes place on day five of her stay. Aside from medicine delivered every morning and evening in paper cuffs, there's been no treatment to speak of so far at Rising Star just days filled back to back with activities and feedings and meetings. How keeping me busy is supposed to make me feel less sad, I don't know. Maybe they think I just won't have time for it. 
but I always have time to be miserable. The next afternoon, I'm the last one to make it to the group therapy room. Kim was showing me the way, but had to stop to redirect two guys who took a wrong turn by accident, honest, and were definitely trying to get into the staff-only break room. So Kim opens the door for me and whispers a quick, sorry, we're late, this is May, before ducking back out and abandoning me. Heads turn and voices stop. The people who built this place really liked windows. The sunlight is blinding. I take the sole empty chair in the circle of a dozen residents while everyone watches. I give about an eighth of a smile and a one-fingered wave. I expect everyone to say, hi, May, like an AA meeting on TV, but nobody says a word. What a welcome. The woman running the group, Siona, actually does welcome me. She is very blonde, but very much a mess. She has, I woke up like this hair, but from a month ago, and her flowy clothes are covered in some sort of animal fur. If I'm still here at Christmas, I'll get a relent roller. Oh, it's really just a misunderstanding, I say, when Siona asks me to tell the group why I'm at the facility. I mean, I've been sad, but they think I tried to kill myself when I really wasn't trying to kill myself. It's just, uh... For a split second, I know I sound ridiculous. It would be impossible to explain to these people what happened up there on that building. Siona smiles and nods. I try to look at the other kids without being obvious. Well, we're happy you're here. We were just about to play a game if you'd like to join us. Mental hospital games? This doesn't sound like the best idea. Starts off fine. We go around the room and introduce ourselves, our name, age, where we're from, how long we've been at Rising Star. May 17, from three hours due north, just five whole days in. While one of the other girls is talking sincerely about her efforts to create a support system in her life, Sarah, 16, Philadelphia, three months. I realize that half the day has passed and I haven't cried once. There hasn't actually been time, I guess. From the minute they shouted at us to wake up, I've had something I needed to do. Rosemary, 17, Charlottesville, seven months. And around it goes until we've all had our moment. Rosemary makes me sad to look at. I know I do a lot of crying, but I keep up a pretty good facade, whereas this girl looks like she is on the verge. Like any second now, it's all going to come pouring out. Every single sad moment that's ever happened to her in her short life. Her hair is greasy and droops over her shoulders, and her skin is heavily marked with acne. She can't catch a break, I think. Siona hands out paper and markers to everyone in the group. The guy next to me, who I recognize from my class, puts his hand on the back of my chair as he passes along the paper. Then he leans in and takes a good long sniff in my direction, propping his chair up on two legs. I raise one eyebrow. I'm not entertaining this. Fuck off, I mouth, and he smirks, but sits back in his chair. First impressions, that's what this game is all about. I get to write down what I think of all these people, well, being nice, of course. And then we get to talk about why these impressions are right or wrong. I know what Miss Daisy Moonchild Siona is trying to teach us, that we're all unique flowers with dozens of different petals making up the complex beings we are. That what people think of us can't define us, can't direct the course of our lives. Get us to think about who we actually are and what fills in those blurry edges. Siona has too much faith in this group and by the time we get to Mr. Sniff, it's obvious. While I label my fellow residents with accurate sentiments, Rosemary, interminably sad, Sarah, stoic and steeled, my buddy Nestor, the sniffer who I kindly called curious, ambitious, and seeking more than his current life is offering, really fucks this game up for everyone. Not that I was liking playing it, not that I could relate to Rosemary's interminable sadness and permanent verge of tears feeling or to Sarah's braced shoulders ready for this shit to hit the fan again and again and again. Nope, here comes Nestor with a shitty smile and uncombed hair and patchy beard, 16 years old and from the house around the corner, a lifelong inmate here just trying to make people upset. 
Nestor, Siona says, what's your impression of Rosemary? Rape baby. It's like he grabs Rosemary by the throat and drags her into a TV with him and we're all just sitting there watching, a horrified but eager audience wondering what will happen next. But Rosemary surprises me. She doesn't yell at him or cry or anything. While my existence may be the result of a crime, that does not define me, she says. It may have been recited after weeks of memorizing the sentence in her therapist's office, but it's effective. It shuts them right down. Nestor, that was completely inappropriate, Siona says, trying to make her breathy voice sound firm. If you can't participate correctly, I will have you escorted out. He offers the room an icky smile and stands. Sarah squares her shoulders even more. Her face is so soft and sweet, and I'm afraid of what's coming for her. And then he screams at us. Inbred. He looks at a gloomy kid named Nick. Fat, ugly whore. He directs this as a quiet, a quiet girl named Isabella. Plain ass vegetable. Sarah doesn't move. Siona stands and rushes to the door, slamming her palm onto a red button next to it. Sirens go off in the hall and a light above the door begins flashing. What he says next is so racist I can't even repeat it in my own head, but the recipient of his comment, Andre, does not hesitate. He lunges, and rightfully so. Before his fists strike Nestor's face, the jerk gets one look at me and says, with spit escaping his lips, dyke.